Well, today we are so excited to be joined by one of our dear friends of the ministry, Jenny Allen. Well, Jenny is a dear friend of Mm -hmm. our ministry. She is a Bible teacher, author of several books, and founder of The If Gathering. We're sure many of you are familiar with her ministry, and it's really special to have her here with us today Mm -hmm. because Jenny's passion for biblical truth really mirrors ours here at Proverbs Mm -hmm. 31, and she really is like family to us, really and truly, and it's so fun to have her here. But Jenny, before we let you teach, we do want to ask you one question. Okay, are you ready? I I think so. (laughs) Okay. Now, I know that you are a Texas gal. So if you could only have chips and salsa or chips and guac Mm. for the rest of your life, one or the other, which would it be? That's And queso is not an option here, right? These no, are the uh, two choices. No, no, no. Okay. We're get, we're, but I get queso still, correct? Um, this matters. We, we can make that amend, amendum to the rule. Uh, amendment? Addendum? I don't know. <laughs> but we can, we can make that exception. The there you go. <laughs> queso, okay, so I would never do queso and guac. So I will pick salsa because the queso is at play. But if it weren't okay. at play, I would do guacamole. Okay. I, <laughs> I, don't know. Know. I appreciate well, that strategic answer. That, yeah. I, I yes. like the insertion of the, the, the queso <laughs> I situation. I could have been a lawyer. Yeah, you yeah, really could have. I could have, have been I a lawyer. I, yeah. I'll negotiate you and I'll win. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love it so much. I think I would choose the guac. What would you choose, Meredith? Mm-hmm. Salsa all day long, y'all. Okay. I can only handle, I like <sighs> guac, but I can only handle so much of that. It's so heavy. And it's healthy, right? Like it balances it's out the healthy. chips. Because right. Yeah. I guess guacamole is too like mm-hmm. kind of like a vegetable, but but it's let's green. be real, like salsas, tomatoes and peppers and onions. And yeah. when you think of it that way, the chips are just, you know, the the like a bread of a sandwich. I mean, yeah. this right. this is it's healthy true. food. Yeah. So. <laughs> this is hard for me right now because we're recording at ten o'clock our time and it's like prime snack time because I had breakfast you're a long really time ago. You're craving that. <laughs> and it's not lunch and guac now. Huh? And now I want to go to Chipotle. <laughs> Anyways, let's talk about the Bible now, Jenny. Okay. We are so excited to hear what you have to share with us today. So sorry you're having to transition out of this chips right and guac tri- talk. <laughs> I can't wait. I believe you can do it. <laughs> I believe I can do it. In fact, I believe all these things things go together. God has a sense of humor and God yes. loves the everyday mundane things that make up our lives. And I'm so grateful for a God that is that way. And mm. Oh, I love you guys. And I'm so grateful to be here. P31 is our sister ministry. We feel that way whenever we're with you. Um, it, it is so fun to run beside people that love God and have a similar mission. And honestly, it's cool talking about this project specifically because Lisa and your team walked beside me as I created this. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what I'm going to share today and a lot of this book was was processed with you. And so it just feels exciting to be partnering with, with your team this summer and talking about this project. So let me dive in. If you don't know, we're talking about our minds. And I really believe that the greatest battle that we have right now in the world, specifically the spiritual world, is happening on the forefront of our minds. There is really, there's really no arguing this. You can look at the numbers. Coming out of COVID, one in every three persons over the, um, or under the age of 25 has struggled with suicidal thoughts coming out of COVID. We have an epidemic and, and this was a problem. I mean, you think about anxiety and depression and the things that people are struggling about before COVID. So coming out of COVID is just exacerbated, or exas- sorry guys, exacerbated. And so we've got an issue and we we know it. And, and you know it because you all know people that are struggling with their minds. You all know somebody that is open and talking about the anxiety they feel. But honestly, probably every single person listening today struggles in some form or fashion with anxiety today. Like today, you will have some thought that feels out of control. And so what we're going to talk about today specifically is we're going to look at a passage, 1 Corinthians 10, and, and we're going to talk about that war because the problem is we haven't seen it as a spiritual war primarily, and we haven't fought it with the spiritual weapons that God has given us. And, and 2 Corinthians 10 is a beautiful passage, and it ends, I'll go ahead and give you a hint, it ends with the, the phrase, the passage we're going to look at today, ends with the phrase, take every thought captive. So the context of the passage is actually set in 
in our minds. He, he's talking about the war for our minds. And, and he begins the passage by saying that we do not fight spirit with fleshly weapons. So I want to actually read, read this passage to you because what I know is for all of you listening, there's a little bit of helplessness when it comes to our, our brains. There's a little bit of a sense of, can I really change the way I think? Because honestly, before I set into this, maybe I knew the answer to that, the right answer that it was, yes, I can change my brain, but I don't think I actually ever did it. Like, I don't think I actually moved into the recesses of my brain and actually interrupted my thoughts and changed them. But this passage changed everything for me. So let's look at it. Second Corinthians 10 Verse four, the weapons we fight with are not of the world. They're not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to destroy strongholds. Now, what we know is that there are weapons that Christians are given that fight spiritual things. They're not of this world, although there are lots of useful weapons of the world um, that I believe in when we're fighting the fight of our of our minds. Number one, medicine. Number two, counseling. Um, number three, the people that God's put in your life, right? We we need some of those weapons sometimes to fight. And the church hasn't done the best job of talking about this and saying that it's okay. Medicine, counseling, those things have been tools that God has used in our family's life that I cannot imagine where we would be without those things. And there are times and places for those things. But But what I want to talk about and what Paul's talking about in this passage is actually the spiritual fight that we have. And this is the, this is the way that we've confused it is, is we've simplified it down to this idea that, oh, you don't have enough faith or just pray about it. And, and the truth is, this is war. Like the enemy hates you. And this is the best place for him to get you. And he did it to me for 18 months. And I talk about this in the book that for 18 months, in the middle of the night, 3 a.m., I woke up and I began to question my faith in the dark with really little to no resistance from me or anybody that that loves me because I never talked about it. And I literally just sat there and I didn't even think much of it at first. It was just these questions of, is this true? Do I really believe this? And, and I would just spin around this idea and this doubt that was growing in me about my faith. And for 18 months, that happened every single night. I finally mentioned it to to two dear friends. Some of you know these two friends. One of them is Esther Havens, who's an incredible humanitarian photographer. The other one was Ann Voskamp. We were actually in Uganda traveling together and telling stories over there. And, and it was just one of those days where I, I was confronted with how difficult this had become for me. And how I felt like my faith was just slipping through my fingers. And and I finally, you know, say, hey, this is what's been going on in my life the last few months. And it was more than a few months. I mean, it was it was a year and a half. And so I, t- I told them that day. And it was the first time that I said it out loud. And guys, number one, the first thing that happened was they they rose up in truth against that lie. And they said, you are a person of faith, Jenny. We have watched you live in these 18 months and you actually really love God. Like it's not pretend, you're not faking it. You love Jesus. I see it in your life. I know that's true. So there was that immediate truth telling of that's not even true. You are are full of faith. God has given you faith, gifted you with it, and you're full of it. The second thing they made clear was this is spiritual attack. Now, Now, I'm kind of laughing at that even at the time, because it was so obvious the moment I said it out loud that I had been under spiritual attack. But for 18 months alone in the dark with the devil, that never crossed my mind. And I I don't even know what to make of that. I'm a Bible teacher. Like I, I don't even, other than he's good, right? He's a good liar. He's not, he's not bad at it <laughs> or he wouldn't be so effective. Um, and so, you know, this really lit under me a, a passion for our minds because it scared me. It scared me that for so long, someone who is in the word of God, surrounded by godly people, fighting for other people to be free, could be lied to for 18 months about my faith and about the existence of God. And my faith began to erode 
just because I did not fight and protect and guard my mind. And so 2 Corinthians 10 has become this, these fighter verses for me, these verses that, that I've memorized, that I hold to, that I, I say regularly to myself, that I, I fight for my own mind regularly. Because what I know to be true now is that I let the enemy beat me up for 18 months and I didn't so much as even, even mention it to anyone, more or less fight back. And then I read 2 Corinthians 10 and Paul saying, we have weapons and those weapons, they actually destroy, demolish is the version I'm looking at right now. Demolish strongholds, demolish them. <laughs> and, and if that doesn't excite you, if you're listening to this and you're thinking, I don't know if I believe this. Let me, the great news is God had me walk through this in a way that was so visceral that I felt like I was losing my faith. Now that sounds good months later, but but what it looked like at the time was a fear of death that grew to where I would be, I would be near a panic attack when I would be confronted with death, with death. Because all of a sudden, if God wasn't real, I didn't believe there was another religion. I just thought it went to black and that scared me to death. So this was very real. And what happened the minute that I rose up to fight it with the power of God and the weapons that he's given me that I'll mention in a minute, there was victory. And there was a complete change, not just in the middle of the night in my thought life, but in the anxiety and the fear, fears that had grown in me. And, and then, you know, the next verse says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, which was what was happening in my mind. And I would say is at the root of so much of our anxiety and so much of our fear is what we believe about God, the knowledge of God. It's why Paul talks about so many times in scripture, controlling our thoughts and and choosing to think about what is lovely, what is true, what is good. You see that in Philippians. And so you see these constant commands, command language given to the way that we think. And then he says, we demolish these arguments that are lifted up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. The power of what we're talking about today, the power of of what we're gonna look at in this book is that God's word makes very, I won't call them severe promises, promises that, that we have been given spiritual authority over a lot of things but specifically spiritual authority over our minds, that we do not have to let them control us. We control them. And I think about the spirals that that I let myself get into. Some of them are really small, right? Some of them, I'll have one today, I bet. I'll have one. I haven't had it yet, but I'll, oh, wait, what am I saying? I have had it. I woke up, let's go to that one. I woke up cranky um, because I have had two nights where I just didn't get a lot of sleep. And I woke up today and I looked at my calendar and I began to panic because I looked at my calendar and I saw um, too much. It was all squeezed in. This is just a little example. And so I got anxious. So, So that anxious spiral began to make me feel like, okay, I need to control this. And I need to fix this situation. And so I text one of my teammates and I was like, can you do this today? Can you change this? Can you, and I just start bossing her and being mean. And, and then now, so now what, what, you know, what, what, when I woke up as just a little bitty thought led to my emotions and my mood, right? I I got anxious at, at my day. I was already a little bit cranky. Now I'm kind of angry. Now that affects a relationship And then I have to apologize and clean that up. And so all that happened, of course, I thought it was really lovely and holy just a minute ago when (laughs) I was saying, yeah, I haven't had anything today, but all that (laughs) happened just like an hour ago. Um, So all that happened. And then now my relationship with my teammate is, is injured. My mood, my relationship with God is distant because I'm just not in a good mood and I'm cranky about the work that he's put before me in this very full day. All of that happened. And, and what God has given me power over is to interrupt that spiral. And the most powerful and most helpful place to interrupt it is at the moment of thought. So when I open my calendar just this morning, a different way to do that would be to submit that to the Lord and say, you know what? I don't have to worry. He gives daily bread. I don't have to be afraid that he won't give me what I need for this day. He will give it to me. And, and I know truth. And, and when Paul talks about things like think about whatever, think about things that are true in Philippians, what he's saying is 
Don't spiral about things you can't control. Don't spiral about things that aren't even real. How much of what makes us anxious is pretend. It's not even real. The truth is my day is going to work out just fine. All of it's going to happen. And I'm probably going to be smiling at the end of it because it was a great day because I had a great time because God, you know, I was around great people and I have awesome meetings on my day, but my mood affected my thoughts and my thoughts affected my relationships and my words. And, and what God says is the power I give you it's okay that you woke up cranky, right? That's harder to control. It's harder to just not feel cranky, right? If I say to all of you like, hey, quit being cranky, that's just not helpful. But if I say to you, that thought pattern that you have been thinking all day that has made you cranky, that has fed your crankiness, that can be interrupted. And that can be interrupted with truth that's real and tangible. And the word of God is clear and living and active and has put in black and white for you to interrupt pretend spiraling thoughts that no longer have to control you. The weapons that Paul's talking about here are so powerful and you see it throughout scripture. He doesn't spell them out exactly right here, but you see them throughout scripture. We know the weapons that we have to fight with. Number one, it is the word of God. We know that is our most powerful weapon. It is the sword of truth. This pierces joint and marrow and bone into our soul and changes us. The word of God is the first weapon. The second weapon is, And I love this one, and we don't talk about this one enough, is the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is our helper, our counselor, our friend, our promise, our reminder, constantly reminding us of the truth. He walks with you. The Word of God is living and active, but the Spirit of God is alive, and He's inside of you and with you if you believe in Jesus Christ. And that Spirit changes us from the inside. I've seen Him do it again and again and again. He's done it today in me. He is is wooing us back to to God. He is with us and, and he loves us and he's fighting for us. And, and I think that idea that, that he is a God that is not just alive in heaven on a throne, but he is a, a God that is alive in us, with us. That is a world changing truth. If you don't understand that and believe that, that right now, as you drive as a believer in Jesus Christ, and you're listening to this, the spirit of God is with you. He is for you. He's equipping you for every good work that he prepared in advance for you to do. And and I think because we don't actually believe that and we don't take that in and we don't dwell on that and we don't ask him for help, (laughs) right? I mean, that's the thing. It's like, okay, maybe you today believe that he he is with you, but have you asked him to help you? Have you asked him to fight for you? And And that's where that relationship with God actually takes root because no longer are we just slapping a verse on it, but we're talking to our God that's with us and alive and for us. And we're saying, hey, help, (laughs) help. My most favorite regular prayer is help. I I say it Mm -hmm. all the time. And you know what? He does. Because what I'm doing in that moment is I'm turning my eyes to him and saying, I can't do this and I need your help. And he loves those prayers. God loves those prayers. So the word of God, the spirit of God, and lastly, the people of God. And guys, this is where I'm going to challenge you today. This is your takeaway. If somebody needs to know what you're struggling with, somebody, those thoughts, those spirals, some of you have had those spirals for a decade. Like you've had the same anxious feeling and thought that has paralyzed you for a decade. And I wish I were kidding or being um, facetious, or this is an exaggeration, but it's not because I've had too many women come up and tell me, hey, I have fought this lie in my life since I was a child. So for some of you, it's more than one decade, right? And and what I would say to you is, is that's a stronghold. That, That lie that you believe that the enemy has given you, that's a stronghold. It can be fought. And the way we fight it is by saying it out loud, not living in the dark alone with the devil, which is what I did for way too long. We don't have to be in bondage for 18 months. We don't have to be in bondage for 18 years. We don't have to be in bondage for 18 minutes. Our God is more powerful than the devil. And so now what it looks like in my life, what it looks like in my life is I turn to that lie and I fight back. If the enemy is coming for me, then I am gonna go on the offensive, not the defensive. And I'm going to to protect my inputs. I'm going to believe truth. I'm going to quickly let people into the dark recesses of my mind where the enemy lies to me. And I'm gonna say it out loud. And I am going to trust and pray and depend on the spirit in deeper ways. And guys, it changes everything. Wow. So good, Jenny. Mm -hmm. Um, Those points at the end were so helpful. Um, I have a question based on um, just at the beginning, you were talking about that 18-month struggle that you had where you woke up at 
3 a.m. and I think everybody listening has either had those moments or maybe Mm -hmm. they're in it or they're nervous about it coming up. But a question that I have is I thought, why did Jenny wait 18 months to tell somebody Mm -hmm. about this? Like, Mm -hmm. and I heard you say, sometimes whenever spiritual attack is happening to you, you're blind to it. But like, is there a reason that you didn't invite someone in sooner? And why do you think that that there's a reason that we don't trust people with this? Like, are we embarrassed? Like what's happening? Yeah, I definitely think for a lot of people, that's that's shame, right? We Mm -hmm. were afraid to say the thing out loud. I have a friend that struggles with lust and, you know, she forever did not tell anybody that because she was just Mm -hmm. embarrassed. Um, And, and she didn't, she just didn't know that that was an okay thing to tell people. And, and that was, that's a real reason. And I think the enemy uses that a lot of times to cause us not to share. Mm -hmm. But I would say, you know, the main reason that I, I didn't in this case was I didn't think it was a big deal. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize how much of my mind was changing Because it's the middle of the night, right? Like I'm not overly thinking about my thoughts. I don't think we regularly overly think about our thoughts. I I think that's a common problem. But especially in the night, I think it's a really strategic time for the enemy to attack us because our guards aren't up. We're tired. We're trying to go back to sleep. It's just, Mm -hmm. it's passing thoughts that you're not giving a lot of attention to. I don't think I saw the theme until I saw the anxiety developing about death and Mm -hmm. about you know, I, I think in the daytime I was okay. Mm-hmm. And so it just didn't come up. I but know. looking back, mm-hmm. that that's why I felt so passionate about this project was because uh, I accidentally fell into such a dark thing so mm-hmm. quickly. Yeah, I think and, you said something really important there is that oftentimes it's the symptoms mm-hmm. that we don't recognize start back at your thoughts. Mm-hmm. So for you, Jenny, it was... The symptom was all of a sudden you had this terrible fear of death, but you had, it took a minute to lead it back to, it was these thoughts that Mm -hmm. I was having in the middle of the night that were then following Mm -hmm. me through. What other kind of symptoms do we see from Mm -hmm. negative, unhealthy thinking? (laughs) Well, Proverbs says that as a man thinketh, so he is. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It is the most terrifying verse that we are literally what we think. Mm -hmm. So I would say any thing about you is somehow rooted back in your thoughts Mm. that there is a place where you either believed a lie or fed a fear or fed a doubt. And again, I don't think we're doing it intentionally. Uh, Jesus, when he laid out who the devil was in John 8, it's such a powerful passage. As a writer, I think it's fascinating. He actually says the same thing four times. I don't know if I've ever done that in a paragraph in my life, like said the exact same thing four times. But he says, the truth is not in him. He was a liar from the beginning. He only lies. Like he, he said, I can't remember exactly what it says right now, but over and over again, he says exactly the same thing four different ways. You know, it's, it's, it's that he is a liar. And so I think this idea, you know, again, I come from a side of the church that we just don't talk about the devil very much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so I don't, I, you know, I don't know, um, I don't know why, because it's very, Jesus talked about him and it's very clear throughout scripture that, that there's an enemy. So I think that the results that we see right now in the world all began in our thought lives somewhere, Mm -hmm. the darkness, the fear, the um, pressure that we're all living under the desire to please people and to measure up to people's opinions, the sin we accidentally fall into. And then it turns into something that takes over our lives, right? Mm -hmm. All those things are symptoms that began in our thought lives. And I'll begin with probably a thought somewhere. Sometimes you can even pinpoint it. Sometimes, you know, like one thought I can pinpoint was when I was 12 years old with my daddy on a recliner and I was looking at the ceiling and he began to ask me questions about my life. Super innocent moment, but I felt pressure and I began to realize I'm not measuring up to my dad. And it was the moment I began to strive Mm -hmm. in life. Like I I remember it. It was a moment that I said, I have to measure up to his expectations. Yeah. And And that was a moment for me. And I think we all can look back at our lives and go, gosh, I remember the first time I believed that lie, which is, which is powerful, but also scary that the enemy can, can give us a little lie planet and feed it over so many years. Yeah. And weave it almost Mm -hmm. into the fabric of who we become, Mm -hmm. you know, where it is something I look back on my childhood 
Um, and even like I became a believer at like 17. So I had 17 years of not knowing the Lord, of believing lies, of intaking my environment and, you know, my flesh filtering that into mm -hmm. the lies that I believed about myself and the lies I believed about the world. And I look back prior to, and it even followed me into after I became a believer, but I really believed because of my childhood and all the things that happened that I was a piece of trash. Like no one cared. Nobody would want me. Nobody would possibly ever like me. And so out of that belief, mm -hmm. I chose, I made a lot of really bad decisions about boys. Like I went for guys that were mm. mean to me and treated me like trash because I believed I was trash and I deserved nothing more than that, mm -hmm. you know? And as I became a believer and went to a lot of therapy, <laughs> <laughs> um, really unearthed that that was my belief, you know? And unraveling that honestly took me years. And when, mm. even to the point where when I met my husband, I was like, no, 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 no. You like, you, I tried to push him away because I was like, guys like you don't like girls like me. You know, and the Lord used that to, again, show me the lie that I had believed for so mm -hmm. long about who I was, you know, and the scripture verses that I had to, to memorize during that period of my life when I was actively fighting that lie. And y'all, mm -hmm. I still have to actively fight that yeah, lie. That's right. I mean, it is right. so deeply mm -hmm. ingrained deep down into the recesses of my heart. Mm -hmm. That it doesn't just, you don't just fight it once and it goes away, Yeah, you know? Mm. And so I guess I would want to challenge, Jenny, this has been so good, but I want to I want to challenge our listeners beyond maybe the anxiety that you're feeling right now. Mm -hmm. Look at the choice patterns that you've made in your life. Mm -hmm. Look at that, look at those patterns and see if those patterns are a symptom of mm -hmm. some kind of belief that you have grabbed onto somewhere and start to peel back the layers. Mm -hmm. And I think you'll find something there that you believe that wasn't true and the Lord wants to disassemble that so that he can speak his truth to you. Mm -hmm. This has been, wow, yeah. I have a whole page of notes. I, know. <laughs> I Actually, you were explaining your moment this morning and I very much felt convicted. I have some apology <laughs> texts to send. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think it was a little convicting uh, moment for all of us, but also like just a reminder it's it happens so quickly. Oh my god. And goodness, such a reminder yes, to be like, you know what? Yeah. As soon as my feet hit the floor, I gotta be on guard. Yeah. Because I know mm -hmm. like if yeah. I'm not, something could happen and then I'm gonna have to apologize yeah. to someone, yep. which happens well, every day. And, but yes. <laughs> and I do wanna just close with this that that we have a God that forgives. Mm -hmm. And this is not this is not something that we have to measure up in, right? This is something mm -hmm. that Jesus died for. Mm -hmm. And and what I love is that he wants us to be free. He wants us to enjoy the freedom that he died for. But that's going to be a messy road. And sometimes we mm -hmm. we think, oh gosh, I've got to fix this in my life, right? Mm -hmm. And and honestly, it's more of a journey. I love Pilgrim's Progress, that book, mm -hmm. because it it shows that as a Christian, we're just going to keep kind of falling off to the mm -hmm. side and falling in this pit and you know but but god will keep lifting us out and and part of that is what's going to show people how forgiving and awesome our god is so mm -hmm. i hope nobody leaves here feeling any pressure Amen. but they feel yeah. excited that there is grace for the cranky morning praise god <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. amen yes. thank you thank you so much for coming on the show today janine